Chapter 61, Caring for Clients Requiring Orthopedic Treatment. After completion of this chapter, you'll be able to differentiate types of cast, discuss the nursing management for a client with the cast, state the reason for using splints or braces, identify the principles for maintaining traction, and describe the nursing care for a client in traction, differentiate between closed reduction and open reduction, and between internal fixation and external fixation, Describe the nursing care for a client with the fraction reduction. Identify the reasons for performing orthopedic surgery. Discuss the nursing management for a client undergoing orthopedic surgery. Compare minimally invasive joint replacement surgery with conventional joint replacement surgery. Describe the positioning precautions after a conventional total hip replacement. Explain the nursing needs of a client undergoing total knee replacement. Discuss amputations, including reasonings it may be performed and appropriate nursing management of the client. A cast is a rigid mold that immobilizes an injured structure while it heals. There are basically three types of cast. A cylinder cast encircles an arm or leg, leaving the fingers or toes exposed. A body cast is a larger form of a cylinder cast that encircles the trunk from about the nipple line to the iliac crest. A hip spica cast surrounds one or both legs and the trunk. It may be strengthened by a bar that spans a casted area between the legs. This type of cast is trimmed open in the anal and genital areas to facilitate elimination. Non-plaster or synthetic casts are usually made of polyurethane material, generally known as fiberglass. Water activates the hardeners that impregnate the open weave fabric to form a rigid cast within minutes. Depending on the degree of swelling at the side of the fracture, this type of cast may be used initially or a plaster Paris cast may be used until the swelling subsides and then a fibroclast may be applied. Plaster casts require a longer time for drying out but mold better for the client and initially use until the swelling subsides. Fiberglass casts dry more quickly, are lighter in weight, longer lasting and breathable. Clients with synthetic casts have fewer skin problems and may bear weight soon after the cast is applied, depending on the type of fracture. They may also use a waterproof liner that allows the client to immerse the cast to bathe, swim, or receive hydrotherapy. It is important to teach the client to drain water from the cast and let it dry. When applying the cast, the physician put positions the client to ensure proper alignment of the part to be immobilized. Um, they may actually need to support um, the client's buttocks with a casting frame when the body cast or spica cast is applied so the casting material can be wrapped around the client's trunk. Um, if the client's awake, healthcare provider can explain that the casting material will feel warm during application as a result of being mixed with water. A wet cast must be kept uncovered so that the water can evaporate. Most physicians prefer natural evaporation, but may order a cast dryer to speed evaporation. There is, a, there is danger not only from burning the client, but also of cracking the outside of the cast while leaving the inside damp. And um, they can also mold. So the drying cast should be supported on pillows. If necessary, healthcare personnel can reposition the casted arm or leg with the palms of the hands. Using the fingertips or compressing the cast on the hard surface can lead to a pressure sore. Uh, cast windows are, um, or an opening may be cut. This is usually done when the client reports discomfort under the cast or has a wound that requires a dressing change. This window permits direct inspection of the skin, uh, a means to check the pulse in a casted arm or leg or a way to change the dressing. Once the window is cut, a solid piece of cast is replaced in its original site and secured with adhesive tape or like a roller bandage. Leaving the window open may allow the skin or soft tissue to bulge through the opening. Question number one, is the following statement true or false? When a limb is placed in a cast, the joint is set straight to assure bone alignment. The answer is false. When a limb is placed in a cast, the the cast is applied from the joint above the break to the joint below the break. The joint is slightly flexed to decrease joint stiffness. Bivalve cast. Once a cast has been applied, it may be bivalve or cut in two. 
This may be necessary if the arm or leg swells, causing the rigid cast to compress the tissue or interfere with its blood supply. A bivalve cast also may be used for a client who is being weaned from a cast when a sharp x-ray is needed or as a splint for immobilizing painful joints when a client has arthritis. Casts are removed with a mechanical cast cutter. Cast cutters are noisy and frightening, and the client needs reassuring that the machine will not cut into the skin. Once the cast is off, the skin appears mottled and may be covered with a yellowish crust composed of like um, accumulated body oil and dead skin. The client usually shed this residue in a few days. They can put like lotions or maybe even warm bath or soap may help soften the skin and remove debris. A splint immobilizes and supports an injured body part in a functional position. The client would use a splint when a muscular skeletal condition does not require rigid immobilization or cause a large degree of swelling, but requires special skin treatment. Splints can be made of plaster or a more pliable thermoplastic material. This should be padded so that they do not cause pressure or skin abrasions and breakdown. The healthcare professional fits the client with the splint and then overwraps it with an elastic bandage applied in a spiral mode. This helps to promote circulation and maintain the position of the splint. Other types of splint in include like canvas splints, soft or hard ready-made splints. There's actually a variety of splints that support injured upper extremities. There's actually like commercial soft splints padded that are actually contoured to fit the client's extremities. There's a, you can also have some Velcro straps on the splint to attach it to a splint on the injured extremity. Braces provide support to control movement and prevent additional injury for more long-term use. These are made of plastic materials, canvas, leather, or metal. Braces can be custom fit to each client. The nurse must provide instruction to the client and family on how to apply the brace and how to administer um, proper skin care to prevent irritation and injury. Question two, is the following statement true or false? Braces provide support, control movement, and prevent additional injury. The answer is true. Braces provide support, control movement, and prevent additional injury for long-term use. They are made of various materials and are custom fit to the client. Proper skin care is vital to maintain skin integrity. Traction is a method of pulling structures of the musculoskeletal system. For traction to achieve its purpose, it requires counter-traction, a force opposite to the mechanical pull. Counter-traction is usually supplied by the client's own weight. Traction is used to relieve muscle spasm, align bones, and maintain immobilization. The two most common types are skin traction and skeletal traction. Skin traction is achieved by applying devices to the skin that directly affect the muscles or bones. An example is Buck's tractions. Skeletal traction is applied directly to a bone by using a wire, pin, or cranial tongs. General local anesthesia may be used when inserting these devices. The pull is achieved by connecting the attachment from the client to a system of ropes, pulleys, and weights on an orthopedic, excuse me, orthopedic bed frame. A Thomas splint with a Pearson attachment often is used to suspend a leg in traction. Principles of effective traction. So you want to make sure that the continuous traction maintain proper counter traction. See the pull of the traction and counter traction are in the opposite directions but in straight alignment. Suspend splints and slings without interference. Be sure the ropes move freely through each pulley. Apply the exact amount of weight prescribed and make sure that the weights hang freely. In closed reduction, the bone is restored to its normal position by external manipulation. A bandage cast or traction then immobilizes the area. X-rays are taken to ensure correct alignment of the bone. Depending on the site and type of fracture, the client receives a local or general anesthetic for the procedure. Open reduction, which is performed in the operating room, the bone is surgically exposed and realigned. Usually the client receives general or spinal anesthetic. Radiographic studies taken while the client is still under anesthesia shows whether the re realignments are needed. If internal fixation is needed to stabilize 
the reduced fracture. The surgeon secures the bone with metal screws, plates, rods, nails, or pins. A cast or other method of immobilization is then applied. Open reduction is required when soft tissue or nerves or blood vessels is caught between the ends of the broken pieces of bone. The bone has a wide separation. Comminuted fractures are present. Patella and other joints are fractured. Open fractures are evident. Wound debridement is necessary. Internal fixation is needed. Ex in an external fixation, the surgeon inserts metal pins into the bone or bones from outside the skin surface and then attaches a compression device to the pins. Some complex or comminuted fractures may require an external fixation device to stable and position the bone. Because the pin sites are an entry for infection, monitoring for redness, drainage, and tenderness is needed. If surgery for a fracture cannot be performed right away, Bux traction or other skin traction may be applied to relieve muscle spasm or pain until surgery can be performed. Open reduction internal fixation, or ORIF, accomplished with wire, nails, plate, and or intramedullary rod, to the bone with wires around the bone for stabilization is done to hold bone fragments in place until bone healing is complete. Surgical procedures to correct joint dysfunction may be done to minimize or correct joint dysfunction. Clients with arthritis, trauma, hip fracture, or congenital deformity may have an arthroplasty or reconstruction of the joint. This procedure uses an artificial joint that restores previously lost function and relieves pain. Reconstructive joint surgery is performed when mobility and quality of life are compromised. The two joints most frequently placed are the knee and hip. Other joints may be replaced are the shoulder, ankle, wrist, and finger joints. Before surgery, the nurse obtains a complete medical drug and allergy history from the client or family member. The nurse also assesses the client's physical condition and mental status at the time of the initial assessment. You'll want to review the patient's chart and noting any diagnosis, type of surgery performed, and any previous treatment. If they've had any traction or drug use, you, want to, you also want to note um, any of the previous treatment they used. The nurse needs to determine whether any complications or problems occurred because or during after this treatment. You also want to discuss any client goals in the preoperative period that will focus on helping the client to experience reduced pain, continue to be active, mobile, and injury-free, practice member uh, measures to reduce the potential for post-operative wound infection. You want to discuss and control anxiety. At, you know, you want to keep their anxiety to manageable levels, understand instructions, and comprehend the procedures and rationale for post-operative management. Ideally, post-operative nursing management begins before surgery with demonstrations of coughing and deep breathing exercises and descriptions and demonstrations of incentive spirometer. Even if the client is going to have physical therapy, we need to explain and teach, you know, the um, isometric exercises and having them practice and encouraging them that they're going to need to get up and get active right after surgery. Um, also describe other devices that may be used after surgery, such as um, IV infusions. Um, they may need I, um, IV blood, IV fluids, excuse me, blood products, oxygen. They may have a wound drain. They may have um, SCDs, roller bandages. It's also important that we'll need to discuss the, the possible use of traction and the CPM machine. Uh, if a client is scheduled for a joint replacement or other surgery, um, if they're on any um, aspirin or Coumadin, they'll need to hold that to do re uh, reduce the risk of excessive bleeding. It'll be essential to monitor the blood count, the prothrombin time, the bleeding and clotting times. Um, we want to make sure that we're controlling bleeding. If the client will use a CPM machine, uh, it'll be useful that they are fitted before surgery. Um, when they return from surgery, um, as the nurse, you'll be reviewing the um, orders regarding moving, turning, positioning. Um, you have the head a bit elevated. The client with a total hip replacement needs to have the legs abducted with pillows or an abductor cushion. Um, you will need to prevent um, having the hip dislocated. Um, 
Clients with total hips replacement need to sit in an elevated chair or sit raised in pillows so that the flexion remains less than 90. Ice packs can be used to help reduce pain and inflammation at the incisional site. Um, if CPM again is uh, prescribed, they can promote gentle flexion and extension of the knee after knee replacement. Uh, again, you'll be working with the physical therapist and they'll help get them up even if it's the hip or the knee. Um, preventing post-operative complications after joint replacement is an important role of the nurse. And um, providing information related to nursing management to the client who requires surgery. So, you know, you're gonna be looking working on you know preventing dislocation of the prosthesis um, preventing infection any neuromuscular compromise like any trauma edema um, preventing dvt the patient and family will also require um, patient teaching and family teaching after having some procedure um, we'll also need to make sure that the patient has a support system after discharge right they're going to need assistance um, whether it's um, assistance with ADLs, um, ambulating to the bathroom, getting up and down. Um, we'll need to explore what kinds of assistance will be needed. Um, if they need to make certain modifications to their home, um, this also is part of the assessment. Um, you know, in the office, even before they have surgery, we'll need to find out like if they have steps and things like that, because when they're working with physical therapy, we'll need to make sure that before they go home, they at least can get up and down into these steps. Um, we need to provide them information if they're going to require assistance at home. They we provide them information with home care uh, and then they have the information and then we also give them a referral. Um, to these home care services. Um, if they need additional modifications at home, they already have this, the durable medical equipment already provided. So if they need like a shower chair or uh, a bedside commode, these kind of things. And then we provide them printable, printed discharge instructions that state like their physical therapy appointments are set up, any um, symptoms to report like if there's infection fever difficulty breathing anything like that and then what their um, prescribed activity level is we want to make sure that's all printed out clear concise language so that there's any questions they know who to contact so as i mentioned earlier um when the client with the total hip replacement needs to have the legs abducted with pillows or abductor cushions and extended because the opposite position of adduction and flexion beyond 90 degrees can dislocate the prosthetic femoral head um, from the uh, cetabellum. Clients with total hip need to sit in an elevated chair or a seat raised by pillows so that flexion remains less than 90 degrees. Um, Also, with clients with knee replacements, have the amount of flexion and the frequency of use increased daily while hospitalized, and that the goal of the client is to have the ability to bend the knee 90 degrees by discharge, and the amount of flexion for clients with hip replacements should never exceed 30 degrees in a with the CPM machine. Through an amputation is the removal of a limb, it may occur as a result of trauma or in effort to control a disease or disability. The following are some conditions in which an amputation may be performed. So malignant tumors, long-standing infections of the bone or tissue that prohibit restoration of function, extensive trauma to an extremity, death of tissue from peripheral vascular insufficiency, uh, Thermal injuries, deformity of a limb, rendering it useless, uh, life-threatening disorders such as arterial thrombosis. Um, so unless emergency surgery is performed, the client is treated for any disorder that may influence healing. When it's decided that amputation must be performed as a life-saving measure, the following factors help the surgical team decide at which level to amputate the arm or leg. So they try to preserve like the amount of tissue that must be removed to eliminate the disorder, level at which the blood supply is adequate to preserve circulation to the tissue will, that will remain, number of joints that can be preserved, and the length of residual limb that will promote fitting a prosthesis or artificial limb for rehabilitation. So some of the commonly planned amputations include like below the knee, above the knee, below the elbow, above the elbow. So the surgical objective is to create a gently tapering stump 
with muscular padding over the end. So an amputation may be performed using an open or closed method. And in an open amputation, which is also a guillotine amputation, the end of the residual limb is temporarily open with no skin covering it. And in the more common closed amputation, which is called the flap amputation, skin flaps cover the severed bone's end. The arms have highly specialized functions. Consequently, the amputation of an arm, particularly the arm with the dominant hand, requires great physical and emotional adjustment during the preoperative as well as the postoperative period. Fortunately, most clients with arm amputations can be measured for a prosthesis shortly after the surgical scars heal. Several types of prosthesis are available for arm amputees. A shoulder harness with cables that attach to a mechanical terminal device, referred to as a hook, a semi functioning cosmetic hand that can be substituted for a hook and a myoelectric arm. Leg amputation. Amputation of a leg is more common operation than an amputation of an arm. The above knee amputation, aka, is more disabling than a below knee amputation, bka. Therefore, unless evidence suggests that the knee cannot be saved, every attempt is made to amputate below the knee. The trend is to have a temporary prosthesis attached to the plaster shell covering the lower limb immediately after surgery. It reduces psychological trauma for the client because it promotes a more intact sense of body image after surgery. The surgeon informs the client of the potential phenomenon of phantom limb sensation, which is a feeling that the amputated portion of the limb still remains. It is normal, frequently occurring occurring physiologic response after amputation. Phantom sensation can persist for months or decades or can come and go. Although clients are aware of phantom sensations, they usually learn to ignore them. Phantom pain is pain or other discomfort such as burning, tingling, throbbing, or itching in the missing limb. Pain felt from the phantom limb can be an extremely serious problem in the relation to the client's emotional status and the ability to use a prosthesis. Severe prolonged phantom limb pain may require surgical remo removal of the nerve endings at the end of the stump. Rehabilitation. The success of the amputee's rehabilitation depends on the variables such as age, type of amputation, condition of the stump, physical status, condition of the remaining limb, concurrent debilitating illness, visual, motor coordination, motivation, and cooperation, clients vary greatly in their learning capability and the ability to master the use of the prosthesis. The, the period allotted for training also varies with each client. It's vital that the physician, the nurse, the physical and occupational therapist, the family, and the client maintain realistic expectation throughout the rehabilitation period. The nursing management of an amputee can be segmented into two key functions, those before surgery and those after surgery. In general, pre-surgical nursing management involves considerations for any surgery, specifically taking a complete medical drug and allergy history and evaluating the client for mental and emotional acceptance of the surgical procedure. Assessing motor and strength flexibility of other joints is important to determine potential problems involving rehabilitation. If the client is acutely ill, such as with gangrenous limb or related fever, disorientation, electrolyte imbalances, the nurse monitors circulation and limb for changes, such as severe pain, changes in color, lack of peripheral pulses. Nursing intervention should aim to reduce pain and anxiety, support the client as he or she begins to grieve the loss of the limb, and adapt to potential changes. The nurses should administer analgesics before surgery to clients with severe pain. Other comfort measures include handling the painful limb gently. Before surgery, the nurse should explain all routine preoperative preparations, reinforces what the physician has discussed with the client and family regarding the extent of the physical disability, the psychological, aesthetic, social, and vocational implications, and the realistic possibilities for prosthetic Restoration. The nurse must exercise care in answering questions about prosthetic devices and their use because it's always possible that the amputation may need to involve more of the limb than originally anticipated. In addition, the nurse reviews the postoperative management such as deep breathing, coughing, positioning, routine exercises, and encourage the client to practice exercises in time and the client's condition permit. 
Clients vary in their reactions to the impending loss of the limb. The amount of grief is thought to be proportional to the symbolic significance of the part and the result degree of the disability and deformity. Anger and depression are common emotions. The nurse acknowledges the client's feelings and remains objective and non-judgmental as the client expresses negative emotions. Reassuring the client that his or her reaction is normal may provide comfort. The nurse should not shame, cr criticize, or trivialize this behavior. How well the client can cope usually depends on prior experience and how he or she has dealt with previous loss. The nurse protects the client from additional sources of stress. While the client is preoccupied with the potential loss, the nurse should not make unnecessary demands or expect full participation in plan of care. The nurse provides assistance with activities that at any other time the client could carry on independently. The nurse also promotes adequate sleep, coping mechanisms, fostering communication with family and friends. Discharge teaching depends on many factors, including length of hospital stay, type and location of the amputation, the age and physical condition, and the type of dressing and prosthesis the client wears. Factors related to the home environment influence the plan for rehabilitation at, after discharge. Some clients need to modify their living arrangements with a wheelchair and other accommodations. Question number three, by the time of discharge from the hospital, a patient with a knee replacement should bend the knee how many degrees? The answer is D, 90 degrees. The goal for the client is to have the ability to bend the knee 90 degrees by discharge. This concludes our lecture for Chapter 61, Caring for Clients Requiring Orthopedic Treatment. If you have additional questions, please reach out to your instructor.